it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I always feel kind of emotional when I come back to UMass because it feels like the mothership um, in so many ways along the lines of what Arjun uh, mentioned. And it's just a great pleasure to see so many friends, of course, my former professors, now friends, um, all of the generations of alums that are here, my own classmates and people before and after. Um, and then now to also have the same privilege that Arjun mentioned of having some of my former students as students here makes you really feel like things are coming full circle. Um, I just want to extend my profound thanks to Jerry and Bob um, and Nicole, and Kim and Don Goldstein and Enid Ardvidsson for all of the collective work associated with bringing us all together, the special issue of the RRPE, and then this event. Um, I think the last time I might have been um, at an event here might have been the inauguration of Karate Hall, and I can remember um, that wonderful event as well. So that also makes this feel in a very bittersweet sense, uh, like things have come full circle. Um, and it's really a privilege to get to have some time here and then in print to reflect on Jim's work, um, its massive influence on my own thinking and my own career. Um, and I know that we're all here to really celebrate and honor and reflect upon the life and the scholarship of someone, I mean, whom we all just love deeply, we admire, but I think we also all just love Jim and miss him a great deal. Um, and I know we'll be sharing stories of a personal nature this afternoon. Um, and so I'll confine my remarks this morning uh, to the way that Jim's work shaped my own and tried to kind of illustrate um, that by just doing a kind of quick discussion of the global financial system, which is part of the paper uh, of mine that'll appear in the ERPI special issue. I know we're all aware that Jim's work and his Irv is broad and very deep. His pioneering work on Keynes is among one of several red threads that mark Jim's career. Um, he's, I think, the reason why so many generations of radical political economists, including myself, of course, find so much in Keynes, whom we might have otherwise, um, and as Jim's work tells us, quite wrongly dismissed as a mere reformer of capitalism. Jim's landmark book demonstrates that Keynes must be understood as a perceptive critic of capitalism. And that's an argument that, of course, ran through Jim's earlier work on Keynes as well. Jim, as well, had an equally important footprint in the study of international finance and in domestic and international financial policy. The, his work on the case for capital controls has been tremendously important uh, to my own thinking. Um, he, of course, played a pioneering role in the development of radical macroeconomic theory, um, his work on the study of the political economy of neoliberalism, austerity, financialization, and financial crises is, of course, equally important to our understanding of the world and to, and to my own work. Um, and there's much, much more, um, as others have already said this morning, and as I'm sure as subsequent speakers um, will also note um, about Jim's Irv. Um, it's really been a genuine pleasure in the last couple of months to reread um, some of my favorite pieces of Jim's work. Um, and his work has always been marked by the precision of his arguments, the elegance of his prose, and his commitment to marshalling an unbelievable amount of qualitative and quantitative evidence to support his arguments. All of his work was marked by his intolerance for hypocrisy and his commitment to policy relevant research for a better world. And I think above all, his work was marked by his unabiding hatred um, of the human ravages of capitalism, especially neoliberal capitalism. And I always thought that for someone who was so consistently and profoundly pissed off at the world, as Jim was, he was nevertheless so much fun to be around, um, and he laughed remarkably easily. Um, and, you know, in preparing for this event, um, I was thinking a lot about how Crotian uh, these times are. Um, after all, and I know we'll all agree here, we live in a, in a world in which rentiers 
lobbyists and autocrats have free run. Regulators lack the political independence, the authority, the will, and the foresight to take on the worst financial excesses. Everything, including nature, is securitized and financialized on the false promise that this is somehow generative of climate finance. Multilateral institutions reflect post-war dynamics and still cannot address sovereign debt crises. Central banks have revived old playbooks and decades of neoliberalism, deregulation, corporate concentration, short-termism, offshoring, and union busting have created systemic fragilities. The crypto bros are heroes uh, to those who live in a Hayekian fantasy world. Um, and Treasury Secretary Yellen, Governor Powell, and President Biden are stuck on the horns of several dilemmas, some of their own making, and some reflecting the kind of know nothingism and the dishonesty of our times. Now, in the brief time that I have, uh, what I want to do is offer some observations and some speculations on the state of play in the global and the US financial system in a kind of Crotian vein. And what I mean by an Akkadian vein, I mean a, an account that's consistent with Jim's theoretical and normative commitments. And chief among these are his concern for the peoples and the nations of the world that are harmed by domestic and global rentier capitalism, his understanding of the cas cascading nature of financial instabilities, and his commitment to developing alternatives to the American-led neoliberal financial order. And with all of this and much else in mind about Jim's work, I want to highlight three 1980s throwbacks that are unfolding against the backdrop of something that is, seems to me to be new. The first throwback that I want to flag concerns crises in U.S. banks. Spring 2023 offered students of bank runs fresh material. Social media, of course, fueled runs that updated the traditional bank run scenario. Banks grew rapidly under lax oversight by regulators who themselves were creatures of Wall Street that were charged with enforcing already weak yet unnecessarily complex regulations that were further undermined in the Trump era. Banks had baked in fragilities and those fragilities were revealed by interest rate increases that they somehow failed to hedge against in a time of inflation. This offers a kind of striking parallel to the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s, a crisis that, and, and dating myself here with some embarrassment, marked the early days of my time studying with Jim was just as the, the SNL crisis was emerging. And in the recent bank failures, we know that clients uh, with, the depo with deposits of a size that households and most businesses could never envisage were shielded from the ceiling on individual deposit insurance. Signature Bank was involved in crypto, which was something that also inexplicably and inexcusably escaped bank regulators. And the result of all this turmoil was the extension of too big to fail to mid-sized banks, the practical end of a deposit insurance cap, and greater concentration in an already concentrated U.S. banking sector with attendant implications for financial exclusion. A second throwback um, that I want to mention involves fighting the last war with tight monetary policies. As the COVID crisis wound down, central bankers, of course, moved toward quantitative tightening. Powell, for a while, tried to push back on the narrative that the Fed was not doing enough to fight inflation. Instead, Powell flagged that the more important culprits were COVID-era supply chain issues, pent-up consumer demand, food price inflation, aggravated by the war in Ukraine, and a recovering economy. And as Powell found there was no traction with this complex and more honest argument, um, he eventually shifted to a less complicated, more politically palatable message that simply channeled a kind of Volcker-esque commitment to doing whatever it takes uh, to fight inflation. And as in the 1980s, 
we don't live in a world where countries of the global north are challenged or obligated in any way to consider the global spillover effects of their policies. Quantitative easing, about, about which Jim, of course, wrote a great deal, had strongly negative effects on financial stability and through its effects on currencies, on trade in the global south. Now quantitative tightening is having devastating and familiar effects on Southern economies, a point to which I'll return shortly. And I can't help but think here about Keynes's ideas as channeled through Jim about the importance of addressing asymmetries in the global monetary system, most notably in connection with the burden of adjustment that falls on deficit countries and the need to control capital at both ends, you know, both source and recipient countries. In the global north, quantitative tightening is aggravating already unacceptable inequalities, aggravating fragilities in US finance, including in the non-bank financial sector, which Jim, of course, also wrote a great deal about the non-bank financial sector. And of course, those fragilities have attendant implications for global financial stability. Um, and again, the non-bank sector was among Jim's preoccupations, particularly during the latter part of his career when he was still writing a great deal. A final throwback that I want to mention um, is the prospect of another lost decade for the global South. Quantitative tightening is having familiar effects on the South, currency depreciations that, among other things, increase the cost of imported foods, triggering capital flight, um, and certainly is activating the perceived necessity of mirroring northern central bank policies, inducing economic slowdowns, debt distress, financial instability, austerity, and rising poverty. And climate finance in private markets, which is already scarce, has become even scarcer and more expensive. And we're clearly poised on the cusp of a new lost decade across the global South with vast debt overhangs and widespread debt distress, but one legacy um, of the current period. And the consequences, of course, are dire, and we're seeing that already. And many in this room have been writing um, about these issues you know, quite recently and powerfully. The debt crisis that's emerging threatens the prospects of reversing by 2030 significant COVID era backtracking on the UN's SDGs. And the lost decade of the 1980s serves as an all too powerful reminder of what's to come. That period witnessed economic collapse, intergenerational social and economic losses, environmental degradation, significantly driven by debt repayment obligations, and debt distress in the 1980s and now in the 2020s share a common driver monetary policies in the global north and rentier capitalism, um, the enormous uh, contradiction in U.S. monetary policy is that it has global reach affecting the lives and the livelihoods everywhere, and especially in the global south, but decision-making is decidedly and stubbornly national and strongly tilted, of course, in the direction of the wealthy. And we talk about monetary policy spillovers as an externality when we teach. Um, but in the context of US monetary policy, that term externality is really woefully inadequate given the outsized influence of especially US monetary policy beyond the US's borders. Now, what's new, and the kind of last point that I want to articulate is about what's new in this context that feels uh, disturbingly familiar. And I think what's new is that we're on the road to a post-American financial order, and the ride um, is a bumpy one, as we're seeing. And I've been arguing in my recent work that we're in a period between periods, an interregnum between an American-led global financial order and something else. And I've referred to this as an emergent post-American financial order. And I concede fully that the US has powerful legacy advantages and that the Fed, the dollar, and the Bretton Woods institutions remain central to the global financial system. But I think that doesn't undermine the point that financial governance over the last decade bears little resemblance to that of the neoliberal order. 
discrete features of an order can pers persist even after their order giving capacities are beginning to evaporate. And the scripts of the old neoliberal American financial order were always indefensible, but they kept capitalism running in a manner of speaking. And I think those strategies are working less well now as the US confronts a rapidly changing, fracturing, and increasingly pluripolar world. Recognition of this fact by the Biden administration, I think, partly explains the Biden administration's recent efforts to restore and modernize U.S. relevance with the new branding initiative um, that it's calling a new Washington consensus. Um, I've also argued in recent work that this moment is marked by destructive and productive incoherence. Destructive aspects of incoherence are ubiquitous and severe. Destructive incoherence, for example, is readily apparent when we look at the failed responses to COVID, debt, migration, and climate crises, rising authoritarianism, and tax avoidance by the world's wealthy and large corporations. Productive aspects of incoherence are found in the aperture and the possibilities inherent in the space between orders. And in this interregnum, there are increased opportunities for institutional and policy evolution and experimentation. We find competition with and challenges to legacy actors and to some defunct orthodoxies. But that said, of course, orthodoxy around inflation targets remains quite durable. Um, we observe expanding financial networks among countries in the global south. An example is the recent expansion of the BRICS group to include new members, a development that is not without its own complications. We also find embryonic efforts to create workarounds to U.S. financial policy in the face of economic and financial sanctions. This is exemplified by efforts to settle trade transactions without the dollar as a vehicle currency in the very slow development of alternatives to the SWIFT system by China and Russia, in the expansion of institutions and bilateral financial arrangements outside of the Bretton Woods world, and the currency swaps that are being offered by some, primarily petro states, to their counterparts when they have faced liquidity crises. Now, Jim, turning back to Jim for just a moment, I'm confident that Jim would have agreed um, with the recent comments of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres um, when he spoke recently and he began this kind of line of discussion in late 2022 and continued it as recently as last week um, at the opening of the UN um, General Assembly, uh, when Guterres has assessed the state of the global financial system. He's referred to it as one element in a five alarm global fire. That's the kind of term he used. And he made the case for global financial governance reform quite pain, uh, plainly and powerfully. He said, let's tell it like it is. The global financial system is morally bankrupt. It favors the rich um, and it punishes the poor. Um, and I've tried to offer some reflections this morning in the limited time that I have as a small way of honoring Jim's intellectual, professional, normative, and personal legacy, which continue to influence me really profoundly. Um, and my hope is um, that my own work continues to reflect the many things that I had the privilege of learning from Jim when I was his student and when he co-advised my dissertation uh, with Jerry. I had a, the dream team. Um, and Jim provided me, and certainly I think generations of graduate students to um, the, the question that was raised at the last session uh, by Lenore. Um, I, I know that Jim provided a tremendous example for all of us as students and now as faculty and to his faculty colleagues, an, an important example of how to live and how to work and how to be a radical economist. Um, and I think there are very few days when I am engaged in my work, when I'm not thinking about the kind of example that Jim set for me. Um, thanks very much. Nice to meet you. My name is Kang Kok Lee uh, at Risenmaker University in Japan. Uh, it's a quite long travel from Japan here, but in the airplane, I couldn't sleep at all because 
I was so excited to see all of my old friends and teachers. Most importantly, pay my respect to him. Uh, so it's great honor to make a presentation of my paper in this great conference. Okay. Yeah, basically, my paper is about Jim's work uh, on the Korean economy. As you all know, the Korean economy was a paragon of East Asian miracle with its uh, very rapid growth and relatively equal income distribution for more than three decades if, until the crisis happening, right? Uh, but the crisis in 1997 occurred. Uh, after that, neoliberal economic restructuring and reform were adopted, and Jim really criticized this restructuring and post-crisis reform process and also financial opening against the mainstream argument. I remember I had long and heated debates with Jim about the East Asian model when I visited his house until midnight. It seems like that many progressives in America and also Jim thought of the old East Asian model like Korea, kind of alternative to American neoliberal regime. And I said that, no, it's not like that because uh, there is also a very dark side problem of the East Asian model, such as the concentration and money, concentration of money and power, and most importantly, depression of workers by this autocratic government in the past. But Jim said that still America is worse than that. <laughs> and, and I just thought that, you know, usually insiders can see problems better than outsiders, right? But anyways, uh, in this paper, I tried to introduce and examine and also evaluate his research on the Korean economy. Uh, also, I'll cover uh, some more recent changes of the Korean economy, including the unsuccessful income-led growth experience of the former government. Okay, uh, let me talk about the crisis first. Uh, as you know, in 1997, uh, Korea faced with the crisis uh, and IMF bailout finance came, it's about 58 billion, the really huge money, followed by economic restructuring plan by the IMF and the government. The restructuring program included uh, first uh, financial sector restructuring and also corporate restructuring to reduce that uh, big time, and also labor market flexibilization, including layoff system, and finally, even more financial opening. Uh, that's exactly when Jim visited Korea. I remember it's in March 1998. And he argued that <clears throat> the Korean crisis was associated with the contradiction of the global neoliberal regime uh, that is quite heterodox and progressive idea. Because at that time, many Korean people really believed that our crisis was because of the problem of so-called crony capitalism. An East Asian model led by the state was quite wrong, leading to serious inefficiency and financial vulnerability and so on. But Jim's view was quite new and insightful. Uh, he also emphasized the external pressure or by transnational capital to replace the East Asian model, maybe with a kind of neoliberal one. Uh, and he presented concern, serious concern about post-crisis reform uh, leading to economic insecurity of majority of Korean people. And he advised Korean people to resist the IMF program very strongly and adopt maybe alternative reform. However, as I said, prevailing opinion in Korea was just to support the neoliberal reform. Uh, I think most importantly, it was supported by Chambers the most powerful Korean conglomerate groups because the reform itself was designed to weaken workers' bargaining power. And as I said, uh, Koreans didn't take his advice, sadly, but GM actually tried to criticize this economy restructuring very emphatically by writing several articles with me uh, for example, 2001 paper, 2000, 2001 paper is written in Korean. Uh, 2002 paper, he argued that radical neoliberal restructuring of the corporate and financial sector in Korea just resulted in a vicious cycle. And Korea would have stagnant growth 
and unequal distribution in the future. And another paper pointed to the problem of financial liberalization and the fall of state-led financial system and also capital controls. That's exactly leading to the crisis. And another paper criticized the problems of rising foreign investment and the huge soaring of the foreign share in the Korean banking sector that might you know, restrain corporate investment. And finally, uh, we also try to refute the mainstream argument that the Korean economy became dysfunctional before the crisis, examining some data. So the bottom line is, uh, Jim tried to argue that the experiment of restructuring in Korea was really bad, never successful, also based on the wrong analysis. And <clears throat> now I can uh, talk about some changes after crisis, including some more recent uh, transformation. Uh, I think that some of Jim's arguments are uh, not that correct. For example, in the 2000 left crisis, still several companies and the government were very powerful and Korea continued to grow uh, to be an advanced economy right now. So now GDP per capita level in Korea is almost same to that of Japan and also many other European countries. However, as Jim argued, many Koreans really suffered from restructuring process and also with stagnant growth and rising inequality, which is exactly opposite direction of the former East Asian mirror. Uh, there was a decline of corporate investment and that ratio, of course, but it's actually high debt model called by rate totally collapsed after the crisis. While uh, there is also rapid rise of household debt with the change of the financial system, uh, most importantly, income inequality rose very fast in the 2000s, together with poverty rate, uh, mainly because of labor market dualization, you know, uh, and also wage share fell significantly in the 2000s. So well, let me show you some pictures, <clears throat> some graphs. Uh, this shows the economic growth before and after the crisis. As you can see, growth rate and investment growth really fell down after the 1997 uh, financial crisis. Uh, next one is, <clears throat> oh, sorry, showing the corporate debt and household debt. The uh, first graph shows that corporate debt ratio dramatically fell after the 97 crisis together with corporate restructuring process, that's exactly uh, what's advised by the IMF. And another graph shows that household debt out of GDP kept increasing. Now it's more than 100% out of GDP, which is the highest level among advanced countries. Even during the COVID-19, it increased. So now Korean people are quite worried about the effect, negative effect, this high level of high household debt. And this is showing the income inequality. Gini coefficient uh, rose a lot after 2000s, especially in terms of market income. But in terms of disposable income, uh, it's actually falling after 2010, which is related with the introduction of elderly pension uh, by the government. And now I like to examine uh, more recent developments in the Korean economy after 2000. Hands, uh, conservative government ruled Korea from 2008 to 2017, two consecutive governments for about 10 years. What they did is basically trickle down economy. They introduced tax cuts, deregulation, uh, but of course, economic growth was disappointing. And as you remember, in 2017, there was a big political scandal leading to the impeachment of the former president, Park. Uh, who is a uh, General Park's daughter. And after that incident, uh, Moon Jae-in government, which is uh, rather liberal and progressive, they came to power from 2017 to 2022, last year. Uh, very interestingly, they tried to introduce so-called income-led growth strategy. Uh, it's a strange name, but basically it is a Korean version of wage-led growth, argued by post Keynesian. So the idea is, to increase the wage share and improve income inequality. That way they try to promote aggregate demand and economic growth. So I think it's a really desirable direction and I supported it a lot. 
so what they did is first they tried to uh, raise, they raised minimum wage very rapidly in 2018 and 2019 in total about 30%. And also they expanded social welfare. Uh, so thanks to these measures, there was really improvement in income distribution. Although uh, conservative economists in Korea and media really attack this direction, very harsh. But if you talk about economic growth, it's not that promoted mainly because of the changes in the global economy, such as US-China trade conflict and the stagnation of international trade, specifically after 2018, right? And more importantly, uh, there was kind of, you know, what I call this de facto, or as a result, uh, fiscal austerity in 2018, mainly because of the shoes an unexpected increase in tax revenue than the budget and then what the government planned. Uh, it is actually ironical because that government announced that it is Keynesian and they are trying to implement post-Keynesian growth strategy, right? But still, they were never enthusiastic about fiscal expansion. So that would be probably one of the reasons why they kind of failed to manage the economy. And in fact, 2018 growth rate was not that good. And finally, uh, if you look at housing prices, real estate market was quite problematic because uh, housing prices rose very fast, almost double, uh, especially the apartment price in Seoul area. So people were kind of angry because the government always said that they, they were competent enough to depress the increase in housing prices. So finally in 2022, last year, Korean people again chose the conservative government led by Yoon suk yeol And I really, <clears throat> I'm afraid about the current government's policy direction because this government again resorting to trickle down economics, they might be never successful. Uh, they introduced tax cut already, deregulation, and together with that, they also trying to push for fiscal austerity. So I'm very, very concerned because that would restrain the necessary public investment in Korea, and also it would exacerbate income inequality in the future. So let me show you some more graphs. This is showing economic growth in Korea. The, oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is uh, showing the economic growth. Uh, in the middle of 2010s, GDP growth has didn't pick up, uh, mainly because in 2018 and 2019, well, fixed investment growth recorded negative, which is related with international trade stagnation very seriously. And this is showing Gini coefficient. Uh, as I said, well, in terms of, you know, disposable income, inequality and also relative poverty rate in terms of disposable income, there was actually good progress. So I always said that uh, it is kind of, you know, success, at least in view of the first part of income-led growth. I mean, income-led part was successful, but maybe it takes time for the economy to be changed and finally to, you know, stimulate every demand and growth. But, uh, Economic growth was not coming back. That's why only half have, have failed, I already said. This is showing the fiscal stance. See, in 2018, Korean government ran huge, you know, structural balance, it's a surplus. By the way, government structural balance is adjusting for the cyclical effect, also calculated by the ratio divided by potential GDP, right? So this is better measure to show how expansionary uh, the government fiscal policy is. Compared with other advanced countries, Korea was one of the most, uh, you know, contractionary stance in terms of, you know, fiscal policy in 2018. And also in 2020, even in the middle of COVID-19, Korean government's fiscal, you know, spending was quite limited. You know, that's why, Lots of self-employed people got angry 
about this story. So actually, so I'm living in Japan. I gave you know several advice about this fiscal policy. Uh, you should you know expand you know fiscal policy as much as possible in 2018. Writing lots of columns and also you know talking to my friends at that time who are working for the presidential office. But uh, it was no use and not that successful. Okay, uh, now finally, I'd like to talk about the meaning of Jim's advice to the current Korean economy. Uh, as I said, his advice to Koreans was to establish more democratic and progressive economic system with a stronger role of the government. I think it's still very meaningful and relevant because uh, what we really need to increase is public investment, especially for the youngsters, and to fight climate change. And even more social welfare for the elderly people is necessary. Given the lowest birth rate, which is 0 0.78, the world lowest, uh, I'm sorry about that, and also highest elderly poverty rate and the suicide rate in the OECD. So even though Korea became very rich, I don't really think that people's life I mean, it's good enough. Uh, they always suffer from, you know, uncertainty and insecurity of their life. And already uh, half of my friends of my age, they just quit, quit the job. So it's really difficult to be employed for long in Korea. Uh, let me just uh, finish uh, my presentation with some old memory. When I first came to Amherst, it was uh, about more than 20 years ago. Uh, same year with Oscar and Arjun and others. And at that time, Jim was really like a godfather for Korean students, calling us always the Korean gang. Probably he, he hoped that we would fight against conservative mainstream economies very you know, strongly. Uh, I really believe that Jim loved Korea and dreamed about better society in Korea. But if you look at the current reality, reality really falls short of Jim's ideal. So I feel very sorry about that. However, I firmly believe that our struggle is ongoing and we will never forget his advice and we will remember him for long. Thank you. First of all, uh, uh, Osgar and I wrote this paper together and uh, we have to say that we struggled. We had a kind of not class struggle, but uh, a kind of exactly. We were we were working under the hegemony of of Don, and uh, we tried to expand the words available, arguing that two of us equaled more than one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so we have a longer version. We we made a compromise, but actually, there's a longer version of our paper that you're free to grab from us. Uh, by contacting either one of us. Oscar is going to speak tomorrow. And so he's said that I can go ahead. We plan to share this. But now so many things have been said that what I'm going to do is uh, basically highlight certain aspects about Jim. And uh, we, you know, in a sense, we, the term odyssey, uh, that comes from a 2018 intervention with uh, some Japanese scholar friends. And the idea of Jim as a searcher is something that that we take as the theme in our presentation and we try to uh kind of cover that search from the beginning to the end of life's journey for you. and um this something that now we're oh where is the machine to which I'm... oh i see okay god that that will help um okay first of all let's just just state for the record here that uh we want to present you with a friendly and happy Jim picture, as opposed to these Darth Vader-like images that we've been seeing emerge. So let's kind of keep it balanced here, people. Uh, but again, thank you to our friends. And um, okay, so yeah, let let's we'll we'll keep it together. This thing is not working so well. But uh, basically, I'm going to skip through this. You all heard the story about. Jim, basically being that the kid from the Bronx or from, you know, that goes to Fordham, uh, kind of naively goes to Carnegie Mellon, and basically all hell breaks loose. Now, he emphasizes here 
uh, the the time in Buffalo and so on. And I I was born in North Tonawanda, New York, so I I know Buffalo and all of that. Um, but and then the war and the impact that that had. But let's go let's go a step backward to Carnegie Mellon, and actually, okay, here we go. Uh, this is the first key point I want to make that's not been made. What was happening at Carnegie Mellon at that time when Jim was there was that you had this radical group. You had the the man who, um, and I'll do, I know we're being re recorded, but um, please, you know, have the lawyers cover me. Uh, do you remember the term that Jim used to use to talk about uh, Alan Meltzer? Big dog, yeah. Uh, I did. <laughs> Just saying it was what it was. Um, so um, that was, but you also had Ellen Meltzer, who was a very accomplished, kind of smooth version of uh, Milton Friedman and that monetarist perspective. And then, of course, you had the, what were then the Young Turks, uh, Lucas and, uh, and Prescott, both to, of course, be celebrated um, unduly for their contributions to destroying Keynesian macroeconomics. And uh, basically, what were they doing now? And now we, we, of course, the joke we had as as bitter graduate students at UMass uh, was that uh, Leonard was going to get a Nobel Prize for work that he had abandoned. Uh, but that was, you know, something that you say when you're, you know, feeling oppressed by having to take uh, Donald Katzner's micro exam. Um, but that said, uh, basically, a very critical deep dive, a dissection of the analytical core. Of the models that was in, that were there inside, or actually not inside, the Keynesian macro models of those days, and essentially this was, you know, go to the roots and drill down profoundly, go to the the essence of it, and start from there. And of course, for Jim, that was the Varesian general equilibrium, which becomes the Occam's razor test: how many assumptions do you have to make away from the Varesian general equilibrium assumptions? In order to make your argument, drill, Jim drilled that into our heads, and that that was that was the Jim from Carnegie Mellon, uh, who basically, in a sense, does that same hypercritical critique of everything he encountered from then on. Uh, now, in that respect, he he takes us to some interesting places. I'm just going to pass quickly through here. This is just we just note that. Uh, first of all, notice that he's publishing in nice places, uh, places that were no longer available to us by the time you know things rolled around. There's been, if you follow the literature on the emergence of, of the kind of travails of the emerging consensus and uh, supply and demand of economists, you know that there's not just the big five journal, but keep in mind that there's an incredible oversupply of macroeconomists and microeconomists from the top five and other places. And they compete fiercely for very limited spaces in the journals that will make their, their names. This is the reality. The, this is the sort of industrial, economic, the industrial organization of that field, which, uh, and so basically though in those days, there was still some space. And of course they were also working with the fact that Leonard had position, others had position, uh, you know, let's let's not keep in mind. Sam was famously, re, you know, thrown out of Harvard, but Sam was at Harvard. They, these things were important in terms of the positionality. And these first, these I'm I'm going to pass by these. These were just articles where they basically made profound methodological critiques of those existing models. Now that then blossomed into this paper here. And now, I uh, now this this paper was well celebrated, and we'll just leave it there, um, and focusing on class struggle. Con Cook, I would say that uh, one of the things remember we Jim and I had a paper that was rejected out of monthly review, based on our 90, 98 visit, uh, because the editors of the monthly review felt that we were not going to the we were we emphasized the class struggle in Korea, which we saw every day when we were there. Uh, they were like, you got to go to the the ultimate roots of the crisis, uh, which is to say the global imbalances. It was a kind of, you know, and of course we all admire the Magdoff Sweezy analysis, but, you know, Jim's point was always, yeah, that matters, 
and the underconsumption and all that and all all that is there. But at the same time, so does the near determinants. The macro structure, international structure, micro structure, everything matters. You got to have it all in. And so we that paper was ultimately published uh, by Malcolm Sawyer. Uh, but basically, here class struggle comes in. Now, I want to just highlight for a minute the contribution that uh, Jim made. Howard Sherman, who became a colleague for us over in UC Riverside for a while, he kicked back on this and said, no, look, it's, uh, I want to say that it's about investment. Now, that notion that it's investment, not class struggle. Now, of course, Jim resists this here, uh, Jim and, and, and Ray, actually, and basically say, no, that uh, basically, keep in mind that last sentence I want to emphasize. A Marxian theory of crisis must be grounded in a theory of accumulation encompassing the forces and relations of production, the competition and imperialist rivalry, as well as the impact of class struggle as manifested through wage struggles. Now, that was always it. Be comprehensive, but understand where you are and which things you can bring into a formalized model, which things you cannot. So there was, in a sense, Howard kind of making a coalition with something that you're going to see, of course, in some of the variants of Keynesianism that we see these days. Now, um, then we come to Crotty's relinking of Marx and money, the famous 1985 paper, which was a million pages long, and which was in the Atomamia, um, wasn't it, the uh, publisher uh, that uh, Rick and, and, and Steve uh, got together. And so that was a great contribution there to give, put that thing in print somewhere. Uh, but basically, I just want to, again, now highlight that last sentence for a, a, a paragraph for, for right now, that uh, for Crotty, how capitalism works is always what has to be theorized. So yeah, we're talking about financial stuff and so on. But at the same time, you know, this, this is something that was always in his mind. And of course, that leads him in the 80s back to Keynes. And when I, I joined UMass in 81, and I started having classes with Jim, Macro one, macro two, macro three. I understand that he didn't do all that. We had Vickers for one, but then we had a lot of Crotty. And I understand that that was reduced in future years. But in those years, Jim would sit on the desk swinging his feet and, the, and have his volume of general theory or our capital volume three or theories of surplus value and reading through it and contemplating. And so he was kind of discovering for himself at that time I didn't realize, he's born in 1940, right? So he was 43 years old in 83. Is that right? 38, okay, so call that about uh, 38 years, no, 48 years old, 41 at that. But just to say that he was, in a sense, a scholar in a discovery phase at that point. And Michael, you, you know, we were there, and you know, that, that the sense of ideas on the fly and putting it out there, that was part of it. He trusted the students to dialogue with him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that was something special about that unfolding. And uh, the thing, too, was that he approached Keynes and Marx without prejudice. Um, and uh, there's just some other things here that I'm going to go through so we don't take all the time. Uh, but basically, um, you know, the, these delicious, uh, this, the, oh, by the way, every, if, it's, if it's in blue, it's from the interviews. Um, and uh, this, the, again, I, I just have to give it up to our colleagues for this gift that they've given us. It's fantastic. You know, these are things he said to us every day. And, you know, he still said the same thing. So that was good. You, you got it on, on, the, on, on the record. And... Um, but then we need Keynes, and, and he you know, goes through in that last, again, the last bit. Marx has got a better integrated system. Um, and, uh, oh, actually, let me go just above that in the fourth last line. Keynes puts this stuff up front, center stage. It's not as good as Marx at all, because Marx has a much better theory of the real sector than Keynes. Marx has a better integrated system, a better historical sense, a better evolutionary sense than Keynes, but Keynes has some properties that are very positive additions. Now, you know, so that was him just reading with kind of without prejudice and finding what he could find. I think there was another page there. Yeah. Let's go through, um, actually, because this is a moment where I want to share something 
that I think, uh, is there, did I go, Ian, well, yeah, hold on now. Now go forward, one more. Now stay right there for a minute. Um, basically, he's there appreciating things about Keynes. I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna look at this for a minute and then let's go forward. Uh, basically to say that, you know, he starts to find these things in the 80s already. He's not going to write that book until 30 years later, I guess. Okay, so go forward one, please. Now, at that point, uh, we're sitting and we're seeing uh, these things. And one thing that happens is that at a time when, you know, we had SSA theory, we had French regulation theory, we had other things going on, regime theory. Uh, became very popular. And actually, um, Crotty, as you noticed consistently in the interviews you all did, and in his perspective, he's always in investigating capitalism as a profoundly unstable system riven with conflict. He doesn't see it settling down into something like a regime. And we saw from M Michelle some of the, you know, re-questioning of what were the 60s about. And so actually, you know, this notion of the the sort of a, interaction between financial and non-financial processes becomes central. This then leads to some very profound consequences for his relationship with the Keynesian. In particular, um, there's, you know, theory Q and then Minsky adopting theory Q. Now, I spent a lot of time with Minsky in the 1990s over at the, uh, the levy. And Minsky wanted to be loved, right? Minsky wanted everybody to sort of say that this is the theory. And he would be, in the summers, he'd bring in people like us, like myself and others, uh, Ray and so on. And then he'd bring in neoclassical people like Calamiris and Hubbard and people like that. Fazari was always there. And he was always hoping that basically we would convert these guys uh, to that way of thinking. And actually, of course, they weren't interested. Um, but uh, that was Minsky. And actually, I remember, again, 10 years before that, being in a, Minsky had come here for a seminar. And Jim, by that point, I guess I was Jim's student, maybe 1983. Um, they, everybody left. Jim said, hi, close the door. So I was there as the one observer of this. Uh, he's, and we're going to have a debate. And uh, Jim says to hi, hi, you have no theory of investment. And Minsky's like, well, I've got the two price theory. And theory, you know, all this stuff. And if you've read Minsky, you know, it's, he, he goes on and on about two price theory. And of course, that comes right out of Tobin and that comes right out of efficient market theory. And you know that that's where Crotty nails him. He's like, really? You got your Mr. Financial Instability and you got efficient financial market theory that the, 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 wiggle, the, the, the ticker wiggles on Wall Street and investment flows? Get real, man. What are you talking about? So actually, um, there was like an hour and a half debate with me as the sole witness. Minsky didn't want to hear it. Um, and at one point, I was like, you know, Marxist. And no, really. And, and, and Jim said, hi, we're Marxists, and we're the only people that get you. <laughs> so that was, um, that was him. OK, thank you. And uh, basically, though, the problem there, of course, and you see this, and you know, I'm I'm considered a Keynesian, um, and we have a lot of Keynesians in the UK and all that. Um, but there's a there's a tendency in a lot of Keynesians to say there's nothing wrong with capitalism that you can't fix with good policy. That last sentence there, you never have a crisis of capitalism. There's only a crisis of the management of capitalism. Mazzucato kind of got that. Randy Ray and the MMT people and Stephanie and those other folks. And I don't think so. Now, it's not that I know what comes next. And actually, that's kind of the question that Jim leaves us with as his odyssey comes to an end with that Keynes Against Capitalism book. Uh, but basically, we then go to that. We're just going to flash through here for a minute. Um, and, and Keynes, what he's doing there is finding these delicious quotes. Um, and note, by the way, because, uh, you know, we've done some, some, work, with, some work with uh, UNCTAD and some of the calculations, the great calculations UNCTAD has done about what it's going to take to do the SDGs and climate change on a global scale, you work out to something, it works out to something like for a $93 trillion global economy, 
uh, the numbers we were, that your your group was getting there at UNCTAD was about three three trillion. So you know, like call it three percent or two, you know, like three something percent of the global economy. That's the effort. Now, again, when we looked at all the actual flows, they're well below that, and these these capitalist bankers didn't want to play, still don't want to really play. But actually, when we look at the scale of investment that Keynes was talking about in the 1920s, they were parallel or even more. Keynes was talking about a significant impact, and of course, he was turned back by the party at the time and all of that. Um, now, just to say, there, there's, here's something about, um, you can find this in Jim's book, and I'll skip it. Uh, but basically, you know, we, it, what we do, and you know, you go through, and you can see that there's some of the preconditions here are very problematic in light of where we are today. What's possible, and in particular, that national board of invest board of national investment, problematic. Now, let's kind of uh, end with a couple of things. One is to say, what does it mean to do macroeconomics? Now, uh, basically, the idea is. You got to have macro foundations of micro, but you need the micro too. Don't go empty. What are your agents? Are you talking about principal agent theory? That's something I picked up from Sam when I was here. We weren't permitted, if you remember, in Kastner's class to talk about principal agent theory, uh, but Sam was into it, and it's like, yeah, that's that's a piece of what we what we need. You know, do both. Uh, of course, start with co concrete reality. Uh, competition oligopolization, very complicated, seeing it more every day, money and credit, and then the endogenous nation nature of crises. Yeah, we got two minutes, and I've got just a couple more points to make, but I want to go one page further. Okay, uh, now this is just, okay, what I want to do is, uh, this was a letter that Jim wrote me. Um, we, you know, we'd going back and forth and so on, and, and at this point, he was Sometimes he'd, he'd talk about things I'd send him, and sometimes he'd just, you know, okay. reflect. I just want to highlight this last paragraph. Um, okay, here's Jim explaining this co-respective competition paper he'd just done, or he was working on. I then lay out an argument that adequate AD growth and many other things that need state intervention in markets are necessary conditions for a co-respective competition, that AD growth and co-respective competition are necessary for high road labor relations. So there are macro and DOC requirements for good micro performance. I then argue that good micro performance is a necessary condition for AD growth and low DOC. I then use this dialectic to explain the shift from the GA to neoliberalism and why neoliberalism can't work in the long run. Now see, that's the, that, that view, you've seen that. That was the challenge he set himself. That means he's not going to rest with one model. In fact, he uh, in another letter that I, we didn't bother quoting, he says, you know, mathematics can get in the way if you're not careful. And uh, basically, let's go one more. Thank you. And um, there was a debate where, now this was with Sam, and uh, this is something that, I say it was with Sam, but it's kind of like around. Um, yeah, that's a I minute's mean, about right. Uh, that uh, basically something that was in the air and we were debating all the time is in, and still, right, what do we do with mainstream debate and so on? And uh, my, my thought right now, did, did we change the mainstream? Now, you know, I said I was one of the research hub leaders for a, a reconstructing macroeconomics national project in the UK, never would have happened here. And did we change them? No, I mean, we had lots of debates with Roger Farmer and people like that, and they still believe what they believe. Uh, it's just, you know, basically rigidities. Um, and so essentially, you know, there was this kind of limitation of what you could do in those debates. It's important, and I would say two things. It's important to know what uh, the other side is doing. What are their models? How are they rigged? What are the foundations? What are the deviations from wall region general equilibrium and how can you unpack them? Don't walk into a room and be unable to understand the logic of that presentation because that will be to your disadvantage. It's not that complicated, but where are their trigger points? And then the second thing, and let's go one more, uh, basically is the, if so, you know, and this is Jim, you can, if, if equilibrium is here and now we have markets that are unclear, then where are we? You know, is this, are they big problems? Are they little teeny weeny problems? 
you can just see him saying this stuff and laughing. Um, but that's a problem. Now, we've uh, improved. Now, uh, he's talking now about some of the work coming from inside models that are, you know, basically like, let's, I'm going to do a model of principal agent stuff and it's going to be this and we're going to kind of nest it. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to foreground this. And therefore, I'm making like three deviations from the v WGE. And that's all I'm going to give you. I'm not going to talk about India. I'm just going to talk about that case. And that's enough. Um, now, he would say, well, so what are you really talking about? And there's the, the thing where he would say, look, you're, you're not going to convert people where that's their thing. That's what they want to do. And uh, basically, that's the game they're playing. Are you playing that game? And there's where I would end by saying, yeah, we can play that game as a game. We can talk to them. We can talk to people that are in those worlds of model making and we can make our points and we should make those points. But at the same time, we need our own communities. We need our own strengths. Um, I'm president right now of one of the, institu of the institutionalist group. We have our own journal. Our RPE is a journal. The RBPE is a journal. These are sources of strength. And we need these independent sources because we can't rely on the journals controlled by editors and others in a mainstream economics uh, uh, profession that is systematically overproducing uh, economists that are competing for too little spaces in the mainstream journals and therefore wiping each other out and denying each other's uh, tenure. While basically, if we count on that, we're out to the curb we got nothing to say because we're no longer even called economists anymore. We got to defend and protect our own institutions. And Jim was one who kind of reminded us of the need for a strong, independent, critical voice, even while we never come to an end, because that odyssey is an endless odyssey. We're never going to come to that end point. Just keep searching. Be kind to the next generation. Keep searching. And we'll get there one day. Thank All right. Thank you much. So is this working now? Okay, everybody. So I gather we take one question, one response. Anybody want to get going with a question for our panel? How about you in the very back, please? Oh, let me make it. I think I have to get you the microphone so the folks elsewhere can hear. Yeah. Thank you for. Three. Please introduce yourself. My name is Isabella Weber. Hey, Gary, hi, Eileen. Um, I'm an associate professor in uh, here in the UMass um, Economics Department. Um, thank you so much for sharing these memories. I feel like since I've sh um, joined this department, there have been so many fond um, reflections about um, Jim Crotty, and it's really wonderful to have this all in one room. Um, and thank you, everybody. I mean, it's so wonderful to meet so many people whom <laughs> I've heard about but hadn't had a chance to meet. But that's not the point why I tried to speak. Um, what I wanted to ask is, I thought the point that you made in the end, um, Gary, um, uh, of saying that um, on the one hand, um, Keynesianism is kind of a management of the existing system. But on the other hand, like if I bring this together with um, the second presentation on K Korea and also Eileen's presentation, um, I think it's not a defeatist stance that follows from this, right? Which is a kind of a challenge that we have to constantly square. So I would be very interested to learn from your reflections on how um, Jim Crotty would have navigated this challenge of, on the one hand, seeing the beast of, that is the system as for what it is, but also like kind of um, uh, asking strategic questions of what what could be done given what the system is. And then maybe as a more micro question, I'm um, going off of the points that you raised in the end of your uh, at the very end of your presentation, Gary. It strikes me that the moment for mainstream economics today is a very different one from say the 80s or 90s, where back then they were still building their own system in a way. I often feel today they are no longer building coherent systems, but that the empirical turn basically means that it's become a, a, a method of analysis, but no longer a coherent system, where at the same time, the inheritance of the um, mainstream system is increasingly unable to explain the problems that we face. So I, I wonder like, what, what your reflections would be from the, all the work um, that Jim Crotty has done, like what, what follows from, from, from that different stage of, 
of, of mainstream economics for um, whatever we can do as heterodox economists today. Thank you. Uh, th th thanks, Isabella. I guess I, I would just maybe say two things in response to your comments. Um, one is, I mean, I think Jim's work is characterized by the commitments that you mentioned or the end of your comments, which is to say, to develop a really rich, sophisticated, deep, complex analysis of capitalism, how it works and how it doesn't work. Um, and he always also was, I think, equally committed to the idea of how to make the system work better and how to develop alternatives to the system so that he was, I think, always working on those two tracks. I mean, in the same way as um, Keynes was as well. And so I think that that really marks when you reflect on his whole oeuvre, um, those two aspects um, of his commitments. Um, you know, to 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 the, the other point that you made, um, you know, I think Jim's work was, you know, he was very much a person of his time and he had, of course, a very long career and his interests, as I think collectively, kind of all of the speakers today have suggested his interests change. I mean, from someone who come, came of age during the Vietnam War, um, you know, and then kind of late mid-career got so deeply involved with studying East Asia and then returning back to his roots in Keynes later on, um, he wasn't someone who had only one tune. He had an extremely rich songbook. And I think in that sense, he was also a model for all of us because his work and his ideas were always evolving as the world changed. And in that sense, he was like a very young scholar, um, you know, throughout his career. Um, and for me, that's been tremendously influential as well. Thanks. All right, thanks. Uh, so a few things to say. One is um, about the where we are in the state of struggle. Um, and I, you know, if you if we go back to, let's say, Gramsci, the war of strategy and the war of position, um, I think that's that's a dramatization from a time that we're not in right now. Maybe it's between a world in which we return to fascism uh, with these strong arm leaders or, or something else, but we're certainly not at a point where workers are in the street, uh, basically, you know, threatening to overturn the, the German Republic um, or, or else go another direction. We're not at that moment. So I think in some sense, we can't, you know, you, you can't um, outthink that. You got to work within the moment you're in. So we see, for example, Mazzucato and her project, um, you know, the idea of, um, you know, that IIPP. It's 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 idealistic. It's like let's be mission driven, right? And it's notice that there's all the vague points around. Like we got to do something, and she's vague about where that's going and and the other accoutrements. And I think that's all right. Um, you know, we're not saying we have to end capitalism. We're going to get to the end of this. Um, the the projects people were talking about, public investment, are going to reduce the rate of of uh, profit, and that's going to have an impact in terms of people's ability to carry interest. And that's true, not just that's gonna hit, not just developing countries, but others. And none of that makes any sense. And it's gonna probably lead to something, but we don't know what yet. So that's the first thing um, is that let's work with things as they are. If nobody's talking about uh, basically uh, socialism as a concept that can be added on to capitalism, then that's a mistake. Uh, David's got a new book out on socialism, and we need to talk about socialism, the, the Jacobin thing. Let's talk about it. And let's talk about socialism, capitalism. It's not either or, it's maybe evolutionary if we can push it. On to the second part of your question, which is, uh, let's think for a minute of what, what Sam did uh, in some of the projects he's done over time. The one I'm, I'd like to highlight would be the work with Eric Olin Wright, and some of the others, there was a name for that project. Uh, yeah. Now that was clever. That was really smart because there were people who were inside that more, you know, sort of persuadable part of of the, um, you know, people at Wisconsin and other places, Durloff and whatnot, who were kind of interested in something else and they weren't dug into the ground. And Sam kind of broke, brought them along. 
So you, let's have a broader conversation. Um, now, on the macro side, that's where people are bitter, bitter, bitter. And uh, and there's where it's harder to make those persuasive moments. Um, but I would say that, for example, if in Isabella, I, I you know that I admire you and I've, I've since we you worked across the water. Let me just say this. Isabella put out this idea that, you know, we got to do something systematic about inflation. We got to think about controls. And she she got a very insulting and rude uh, intervention from a very famous economist who now work, lives in New York City. I saw that same economist, by the way, in 1986 uh, at a panel at the Brookings, at the Brookings Panel Economic Activity, stand up against a, a table after the panel, talking to foreign ministers from Venezuela, Colombia, and Argentina, who were talking to him excitedly about the models that people like him and Jeff Sachs were figuring out for the debt crisis. And they were explaining about the problems in our country. And Krugman's answer was, with his arms folded, I can model that. I can model that. Well, that's the arrogance, right? But actually, what happened with that thing with, with Isabella? Paul Krugman got stood down. He got slapped down publicly. That's a very important moment. You know, what ideas remain? Oh, Isabella Weber's ideas remain. Paul Krugman, shut your mouth. And that, right? <laughs> no, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna have a conversation, let's have a respectful conversation. Don't tell me I know more than you. And some of the people that are even allies, really, they have a hard time doing moving beyond that. People like the Larry Summers and so on. And that's part of it, but let's work with what we can and who we can. But also, as Jim says in the last line of our last line of our paper, you got to know which side you're on. Okay, other question. There you go. Please introduce yourself. Patrick Mason. Uh, Patrick Mason is the new chair of the Department of Economics. Yay, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I had a question about paper on the Korean economy. You, there was Hold up a, your microphone. I had a question about the paper on the Korean economy. There was a year or two years there where the minimum wage increased by 30%. What fraction of Korean workers were covered by the minimum wage at that time? And were there lasting? So I assumed that, you know, this approach to the minimum wage didn't stay in place. So how long did that new approach last? And and other macro, micro effects, like how many low-income people got out of poverty? What happened to unemployment, to the businesses where these minimum wage workers were employed? Thank you. Yes, actually, Korean government uh, raised the minimum wage about 16% in 2018, and then another 11% in 2019. I remember that is the really important issue at that time in Korea because conservative economists and also lots of media attacked this policy saying that this exactly led to the decrease in job creation. And actually in 2018, compared with 2017, uh, new jobs created is really smaller, like just uh, one third uh, compared with that in 2017. But actually, if you look at 2019 and 2020, uh, job creation was again, increased. So there is still a big debate and there are lots of empirical studies to examine whether minimum wage increase is really leading to unemployment and big shock in the labor market. Mm -hmm. And still the results are quite mixed. So I don't really think that uh, the minimum wage hike is really responsible for the big shock in the labor market. However, uh, about 15% of all Korean workers at that time was covered by minimum wage. And if you look at government statistics, another 15% still didn't get the minimum wage. I mean, it's actually illegal, but enforcement rate is really bad in that sense. 
However, I remember at least the share of low-wage workers uh, defined by the OHCD uh, earning two-thirds uh, of the median wage. Actually, that share really fell thanks to the increase in you know, minimum wage. And if you look at uh, some empirical relationship, exactly the wage share and minimum wage increase moved together. What I mean is, uh, we succeeded in increasing wage share, at least after 2018, which was quite closely related with the minimum wage hike, I remember. But the problem is, even though wage share jumped, uh, still it was never enough to promote economic growth and promote aggregate demand. Maybe uh, it takes some time, but sadly in 2020, the COVID shock came, right? So in that sense, I really felt sorry about the experience of minimum wage hike in Korea. Okay. Can can I just check if anyone online wanted to ask a question? I don't think we have anybody yet. Nobody? Okay. Uh, yeah. Go, Michelle. Hi, for Kung Kuk. Also, to follow up, I'm surprised. I understand that China had been building houses that were unoccupied, apartment houses that were unoccupied. I'm surprised there was no push to build housing on the one hand, because of course, it's going to be inflation if suddenly everybody has the means, right? They have higher income. But also, if your wage grows 30%, you don't have to have employment grow if you can, like, you know what I mean? If your hours come down and your wages go up, your income could still increase. So I, I'm not sure. I'm interested to hear employment grew, but I feel like it's not the measure. I think it's really more a supply. 30% increase in purchasing power is crazy for a year or two years in terms of thinking the supply is going to just jump. Can I just add something on questions to, to Congo? Um, so you you talked about the relative failure of, of this uh, income led growth model. Um, it, it occurred during partly during the COVID crisis, right? So I, I was wondering what you think the impact of that was on um, the uh, perception of failure of that of that project. Actually, the public opinion about the income-led growth was really bad. Uh, already in 2018, uh, related with the big debate about the increase of minimum wage, as you said, uh, although there is not strong empirical evidence, at least in you know academic papers, to show that minimum wage hike was really leading to serious you know unemployment effect. But still, a lot of people just believed there was big shock, and I think it could be. Kind of shock, especially to you know very poor self-employed people. Uh, but because of that, government also tried to compensate for them by you know giving some money, public money, to the self-employed and very small companies who employed a lot of you know minimum wage workers. So somehow that's also working as a buffer. But big problem is what I really think. Uh, is that at that year, government was very inactive about fiscal stimulus, mm -hmm. uh, maybe because in Korea, as you know, a lot of people are worrying about rising public debt, even though the government debt out of GDP is just a 50%, much, much lower than that in other advanced countries. But maybe Korean people are still suffering from the trauma of financial crisis. Yeah. And lots of conservative economists actually in Korea, I think more than 90%, of economics department dominated by mainstream guys, right? But the funny thing is, even in mainstream macro, this fiscal austerity idea is long gone, right? But in that sense, in Korea, it's quite, how can I say, late uh, to change itself. Still, a lot more economists, you know, argue for fiscal consolidation that's being done by this government. And the government is exactly, you know, implementing the old, you know, economic policy that was popular in the uh, 40 years ago, right, in America. So something should be done in Korea. Maybe more important thing is we should try to persuade people about the need for increase in fiscal spending and public investment. For example, now the Korean birth rate is super low, the lowest in the world. People say that in 100 years, if this continues, Korea will disappear, right? So in that sense, if we, you know, spend more public money for youngsters, it can maybe increase birth rate. So in the end, in the long term, probably we can have higher growth GDP and even good to fiscal stance, right? 
So uh, I think this kind of effort is really what's necessary. Okay. <laughs> Another question? Another question. We have uh, nobody. Oh, we. Please introduce yourself. Leon Nikumana from economics department. Uh, again, a, a pleasure to be listening to uh, these all these colleagues about the work of uh, my my uh, favorite colleague, mentor. I'll, I'll say something about this later. But I wanted to ask what uh, you read in, in Jim Crowley's work about how he elaborates on the, on the idea of the state doing something to manage the capitalist system. And what kind of state does he have in mind? What kind of state structure, leadership structure? And I want also to add to add a point about yeah, about your observation about how you disagreed about how whether Korea is doing well and he thought that the US is doing worse. And that's something I encounter many times. I'm talking to Africans from other African countries where I say, Oh, Ghana is doing very well. And I say, What which country are you talking about? Mm -hmm. But I think it's a it's a very healthy collaboration between the outsider analyst and the insider. Because there are things you see, but sometimes you may be too close as as an insider, and you may miss the perspective. But my my main question was about the the state. What kind of state? What role of the state? Are we? Did he have in mind? Okay, thank you. I think we can start. Okay. Uh, and it's an interesting question, Leon. I mean, did did Jim Crotty have a theory of the state? I mean, just kind of reflecting on your question. I mean, of course, he had a lot to say about the state that was deeply inflected by both his commitments to Marxianism and and Keynesianism. And you know, he wrote a lot about, of course, state capture and regulatory capture um, and the failures of of the state, particularly under neoliberal capitalism in so many national contexts, the U.S. and Korea um, among them. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, in thinking about your question, I, I couldn't identify a kind of coherent theory of the state um, within Jim's work. Obviously, he had a commitment to the state doing things that, you know, in the neoliberal era were absolutely impossible because of the power of ideology um, and the incorrect premises on which macroeconomic theory was built. Um, in his view, but I, I guess I, I would be interested to hear what other people say about whether or not you could identify a kind of coherent theory of the state and the role of the state. Um, I think Kamkut's reflections on the way that progressives, you know, long idealized, and I think I was guilty of that as well, of thinking, well, developmental states are better than what we have in, you know, in, in the world of neoliberalism, and that that was a kind of naive reading. Um, I don't think it was a naive reading that marked uh, Jim's understanding of of developmental states. Um, and I think, you know, we on the on left economists probably haven't had that much to say um, that really reflects a coherent theory of the state. But others might feel differently. Uh, I have no much to comment, but I really believe that uh, Korea, for example, in the Korean case, the nature of developmental state really changed. For example, in the 60s, 70s, uh, maybe early 80s, uh, Korean state and government very powerful, and we can call it autonomous and capable to discipline capital, right? But in the early 90s, before the financial crisis, I don't really think it's a powerful enough and also autonomous. It's uh, strongly influenced by the, you know, influenced, influenced by the domestic capital, like travel grew too much. So in that sense, uh, if you just uh, leave the state structure just as it is, I don't really think that, you know, uh, the real reform is possible. So as Jim you know, emphasized, probably we need to think about alternative reform together with a more democratization of the state itself, I think. Okay. I, I was just having a look at the um, Keynes versus capitalism. Um, you know, that book is sort of written against the context of Keynes's exploration of 
of the 1920s and so on, and and the evolution of his ideas, interrupted, of course, by the war. Um, and actually, there he's that's a context where the state means the British state, the national state. That's that's that government, you know, run by famously by Her Majesty's Treasury and all of that. So that's a centralized state that has the ability to channel resources as it wishes. That's a topic that right now is very much a subject of uh, controversy and reversal um, in the UK, that there's something called devolution and the idea of more independent fiscal pol policies elsewhere, uh, because you've got a central state controlled by basically committed austerity-based macro people that are now squeezing the life out of that economy. But um, we don't see Jim encountering those questions of the, like, let's say the local, the regional, as opposed to the state. That's not in Jim's work. His focus is very much on the corporate side, the finance, the banking, the competition, and so on. Uh, so I think I think that's an absence in Jim's work. And it does suggest that for those of you working, especially in the green movements and net zero and so on, in many cases, you'll be working at that local level. It'll be bottom-up initiatives. And, you know, you work in an urban department and so on. And the question of urban policy and so on. Those are things that are have to be worked out in the context of, I think, different histor historically specific instantiations of uh, state and market, you know, configurations and so on. Going to be different country to country, but I don't think we get that from Jim per se. Uh, to that extent, that macro foundations are ma uh, micro, and then that rich theory and, and vision of the micro competition among the main players that were on the stage as we go into globalized capitalism, that's really where he's living there and and so on. And that's that's where the the life of many of his ideas are in those latter essays. And and this is a puzzle. There's where the Korean state gives us a question. Go ahead. Okay, great. Well thank you um very much for a wonderful panel. I will say I will, I will say around here, we talk a lot about uh, uh, Jimsky, Minsky, and Dimsky. <laughs> <laughs> so your name lives on, Gary. Uh, no, this was a wonderful panel, really fabulous. Uh, thank you very much, and to Ellen for, for uh, moderating this. So we now have an hour break for lunch. Um, it's downstairs. Uh, so I encourage you to go eat and be merry. And then uh, we're going to try to start right at two o'clock uh, with reflections on 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 Jim. And again, I, I we hope Pam will be here and two of two of their daughters. So looking forward to a really meaningful afternoon. Funny, Thank you.